In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The day is surely drawing near. Jesus' words for us this morning, the end will not be at once. Every generation of believers seems to convince themselves that they are the ones who will live to finally see the end. How long will God let things continue this way? How much worse can it get before He actually brings it all to a close? We look around and we say the end must be near. And it is. We are most certainly living in the end times as God's Word clearly teaches. So where do we find this truth? Well, the book of Revelation is found in the back of our Bible. It's a catchy piece of writing and involves some attention-grabbing sequences and creatures, including, among other things, a dragon, a couple of horrible beasts that are coming from the land and the sea, and, of course, a glimpse at the promises that wait for God's people at the marriage feast of the Lamb in His kingdom which will have no end. As the 66th of the 66 books, the book of Revelation closes out the closed canon of Holy Scripture, and it provides important insights on the whole history of God's plan of salvation. It points to the difficulty and outright horror of living in this world while looking forward to the eternal reign of our Lord in the world that is to come. The words find in this, found in this writing are, were given to us by John, the beloved disciple, as he was banished for teaching regularly about Jesus Christ, the crucified and resurrected Son of God, and the only source of forgiveness and redemption to all those living in this fallen world. While on the island of Patmos, he saw Jesus Christ himself one Sunday morning, and he was given the task of writing down all that was revealed to him in that vision. His words in the book of Revelation build on what we have already heard. The end will not be at once. A good portion of the book lays out the series of events that will take place while the end is taking place, telling it three times from three different angles. First, as seven seals being opened, then seven trumpets sounding, and finally, as seven bowls of God's wrath being poured out on this world. We are shown in these visions what life will be like for us as we live in the time between Christ's crucifixion and His return in judgment on the last day. As members of St. John's, I strongly encourage you to read through the book of Revelation, especially now as we near the end of the church year and continue toward the end of the world. Set aside some time in your week, in these coming weeks, and read through it. Revelation is quite unique and it stands out among the other books in the New Testament. And perhaps for this reason, or simply due to its frequent use of symbolism and apocalyptic language, it has been used and abused by many Christians, drawing a fair number of bizarre and distracting teachings out of it. But regardless of what has been done with the book of Revelation, we, by God's grace, are able to see it for what it truly is, John's words in this book serve as a call for preparedness as we anticipate the last day. Through its 22 chapters, we are pointed to our Savior who overcame death and the grave, and we are shown what it is to be a part of Christ's bride, the church. As the church, we are given the task of sharing His love with all those around us in living out our faith while awaiting its fulfillment when this world does finally meet its end. This is important for us and for all people, because the end times are now. Jesus prepares us for this truth in the time shortly before completing the saving work given Him by the Father. Knowing that all would be fulfilled, that He would be arrested, crucified, and and raised on the third day, He points His hearers beyond those events to the signs of the end of time. While some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, he said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And they asked him, Teacher, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, See that you are not led astray. 
For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified. For these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. To not be led astray is to listen closely to what is taught about God and His Word. It is to daily recognize the guilt of our sin as we confess and repent, and to check what we hear about sin, grace, and forgiveness with what God Himself says about it. There are many who take the Scriptures and twist them to the point of fitting their own personal preferences and desires. They refuse to call sin sin, or at least certain sins, convinced by our fallen world that God's law is outdated or doesn't apply in various circumstances. These are those from whom Jesus Christ calls us away and those He accuses of leading people astray. Ultimately, their teachings, wherever they come from, all point the sinner inward rather than to God's external means of grace. And they point to our own hands as the source of our salvation. Jesus warns us, don't listen to them. He calls us away from false teachers that will be working in the end times and also tells us what to look for as evidence. He says nations will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and pestilences, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. This sounds awful and awfully familiar. These types of occurrences are what keep the news media in business as they point their cameras at the many ways that this world is falling apart. But Jesus then switches gears, and He addresses those directly with Him who had been asking Him these questions about the coming end. He says to them, But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for My name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it, therefore, in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. This was not a pleasant forecast for the disciples of Jesus' day. His followers are told here again to expect to follow Him wherever He went, and we know that He went to the cross in order to make the payment for the sin of the whole world. By His death on that cross, He is able to promise that those who die giving witness to their faith will, in fact, gain their lives. And we are called to do the very same with our own lives, knowing full well that He uses us as instruments of His love, as we point to sin and its poison, and to Jesus Christ alone as its antidote. Losing our lives is most certainly a frightening notion, and the end of the world is a terrifying thought for many. But for, all who, but for all those who follow Jesus as their Lord, both death and the end are merely the means by which our Lord will bring us into the new creation that will be free from sin and its effects for eternity. The book of Revelation points us to this in detail, just as Jesus' words do here as well. After this, he gives a specific forewarning of what waited for the city of Jerusalem. His words here, which he anticipates, took place roughly 40 years after he spoke them. He says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart. And let not those who are out in the country enter it, for these are days of vengeance, to fulfill all that is written. Alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, For there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. The city of Jerusalem, as it was known in Jesus' day, met its end, just as He said. 
And this world will also meet its end, just as He says. Every generation of believers thinks that they are living in the end times, and they have all been correct, all those living since the time of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. The image is relayed to us in the book of Revelation, and here in the Holy Gospel for this morning, surround us. These signs of the end times have been unfolding and continuing since the time of our Lord's crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. And so Jesus equips every generation with these final warnings. He says there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars, and on the earth distress of nations in perplexity because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Things in this world continue to fall apart, and the end continues to draw closer. Jesus, Jesus told us that it will not be at once. As we wait for His promised return to see Him in the clouds, we go forward daily in contrition and repentance, while pointing the world around us to her Savior and Redeemer. We invite them here, we bring them here to meet this Savior and Redeemer, even as He meets us all at the baptismal font and from His altar in Holy Communion, while also speaking daily to us in His Word. So look to the skies for your Lord's return and raise your heads with me as we anticipate that great and glorious day on which our redemption is made complete through the saving work of our crucified and resurrected Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue now by confessing our faith with the Apostles' Creed on page 159. Please stand. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, 